Hello everyone, I hope you're all well and welcome to my first discussion video of Middle March by George Eliot. We're coming up to the end of the first week now and I have to say this whole read long experience so far has been amazing. There is over 80 people in the Discord and seeing everybody's comments and pictures has been truly wonderful and I may have spent more time looking at the hashtag than actually reading. I'm mainly going to be talking about the first kind of 1 to 14 chapters because that's where I, I am and where I am in terms of the reading schedule but I very quickly realised when I looked at kind of what had happened in those first 14 chapters that I'm a really thematic reader and the stuff that I wanted to talk about isn't necessarily plot points or even characters. In fact in this video there'll be loads of characters who I just never mention. I mainly just wanted to flag some of the things that I found really interesting and then discuss them with you because I'm very aware the things that other people pick up on will be very different to mine, hence the beauty of a conversation and a discussion and why I'm doing this read-along. Just so you know what you're getting into, the things I'd like to discuss in this video are Middlemarch as a historical novel, the context of the reform acts in terms of this novel, the role of the narrator and the failure of optimism in terms of progress. So we'll see how my brain does in talking about Middlemarch with you. From the very beginning of this novel, before we even start the narrative, we have the subtitle of A Study of Provincial Life. It separates the goings-on in Middlemarch from the now, but it also kind of brings the connotations of science and medicine, which if you've read the novel or if you've started to read the novel, you know is really key with Lydgate and scientific and medical reform. Throughout the novel, or where I am now, Elliot also loves a kind of scientific metaphor. One of my favourite examples of this, and it's not necessarily even the best example, but it is a character kind of summary that I find hilarious. And in fact, Elliot is funny and she's also really sarcastic. And so far, I love her writing. Um, but I wanted to just quickly read you this quotation. He has got no good red blood in his body, said Sir James. No, somebody put a drop under a magnifying glass and it was all semicolons and parentheses, said Mrs Cadwallader. It's notable that Middlemarch is also a study of provincial life. Automatically, we're separating Middlemarch, a place in the Midlands, as being separate from a metropolis. This separation comes up a lot in Middlemarch, especially with the character of Lydgate, coming with so much scientific knowledge from London, Edinburgh and Paris and coming into this small society. Lydgate is also very aware of the kind of busy bodies and the gossip that goes around in small provincial towns, which to be honest is one of my favourite things of this particular kind of novel. Provincial also has the connotations of being country-like, which is associated with being like narrow-minded, lesser than the great education that's available in the cities. What we also have to remember is that Elliot isn't writing in the Midlands, despite being from the Midlands, she's writing this from London, further separating the provincial town from the city. What I find so interesting about provincial towns is the class system and we have to remember that obviously like this provincial town is a very specific type of provincial life because at the end of the day it's still like the landed gentry and it is still the middle and upper classes. You have Rosamund Vincy talking about how she doesn't like the fact that you know her family are manufacturers and the fact that her mother's father was an innkeeper. It's an association with a different type of class system and I guess not being in the old money landed gentry. In comparison to Rosamund's awareness over her social class or maybe not being like, I don't know, good enough in terms of Middlemarch society, you have Dorothea Brooke, who is an heiress and obviously a lot more a part of the establishment. These two characters are compared to each other, not necessarily directly, but Dorothea is kind of against a lot of the gender norms, the feminine norms that society has put on women, which Rosamund seems to actually kind of take on. In the beginning of the novel you see this most though with Dorothea and her sister Celia. One of my favourite scenes when you kind of see Dorothea subverting the a feminine norm to a certain extent is when she refuses a lapdog from Sir James. Lapdogs, especially in the 18th century, so a bit earlier, with Wollstonecraft were associated with sensibility and feminine weakness and the worst kind of femininity. Dorothea's refusal of this dog shows that she doesn't want to conform to that type of womanhood, but yet she says to Sir James that maybe Celia 
will want the dog. Maybe it's good enough for Celia. And you have this a lot with the different types of jewellery that Dorothea and Celia pick from their mother's chest. I will return to the character of Dorothy and Celia probably later on, maybe in a different video, because I want to go back to looking at the study aspect of a study of provincial life. I spoke at the very beginning about the study being associated with science and medicine, but the study for me, especially when I was starting to read Middlemarch, has as much to do with a historic study as it does to do with science. One thing I didn't expect from reading this novel is how pronounced the narrator would be and how this creation of a fictive reader and a fictive audience really interjects like so often in this novel and it's one of my favourite devices that actually authors use. I'm a lot more familiar with it in kind of 18th century novels and it is obviously evident in a lot of Victorian writing. I mean even in Jane Eyre you have the reader I married him. And although a lot of these interjections and voices in Victorian writing are very like didactic and often like morally righteous, this narrator brings it to a whole new level. There is a lot of dramatic irony where this kind of fictive reader is involved and when the narrator kind of almost speaks over us or makes us doubt what we're reading. And this completely plays into the fact that Middlemarch is a historical novel. There is a lot of debate about what makes a historical novel and how big the time gap has to be. But with this narrator and the fictive reader and the separation between what the narrator knows and what the narrator's reality is in comparison to the characters in the novel, the separation of the time periods and the sense of knowledge um, that almost the reader has over these characters was so strong that it felt impossible not to talk about the historical context. I'm sure you all know, if you have watched any of my videos before, that I love political novels. I love 19th century politics and in particular anything to do with trade unionist movement and the Chartist movement. So as soon as the Reform Acts were mentioned in this novel, I was ready to fall in love. This novel begins in 1829, which is just a couple of years before the first Reform Act of 1832. Eliot makes it very clear to us that the Reform Act is in progress, changes in the air, in the same way that the um, Catholic question is brought up very early in the novel, which is the Catholic Relief Act of 1829. I won't talk about much about the Catholic question, but in terms of the Reform Act, for me that is the key part that makes this novel a historical novel and makes it really interesting for me. But Eliot is actually writing, this book was published in 1871 kind of to 1872, which is after the second Reform Act. If you're a geek like me, this is so far the most significant thing about the novel. The first Reform Act was a big deal because it did open the right to vote for more men, but it was still based on a really strict property qualification didn't actually let many men, or at least working men, vote at all, and it did not meet the six demands led by the Chartists. The Second Reform Act opened it up even more, and it's important to note that the contemporary readers of Middlemarch would have been very aware of the discourse around the Reform Acts, and probably would have seen the first one as a bit of a failure, hence why they had to have the second Reform Act. Why this is interesting is because the discussions of the first Reform Act in Middlemarch, it's almost like the reader of the time and the narrator know that all this optimism and hope they have in Middlemarch for this Reform Act they know it isn't going to go as planned. The knowledge that the readers of the time would have had, and obviously the narrator, who again, because the narrator is separate in that study of this different political time period, you have this real sense of you're kind of looking down upon the characters, especially on characters like Mr. Book, who is for the Reform Act. This is so deeply ironic, because if you've read the novel, you'll know that Mr. Book is a terrible person, he's massively sexist, and therefore it is really funny that he is the one voting, or wanting to vote, or wanting to stand for a really progressive, or what he deems as progressive, act. The amount of optimism that is surrounding this act in the novel and the discussion of political reform and also scientific and medical reform is idealistic and it's optimistic but the reader knows that what happens in those acts and what happens at that time period because of the i guess like the dramatic irony of them knowing how it all planned out they know that that optimism was misplaced or their idealism didn't kind of come through in terms of political change Eliot is also using the novel i guess to explain 
the change that is happening in the late 1860s when she's writing and in the early 1870s it's almost like she's showing everybody well this is where we are now and this is where we came from and this is how things have changed she's using these characters to show that change but she's also being really critical of the optimism that is in that progress she's challenging the fact that optimism in our progressive movements is what can damage them because ultimately optimism is associated so much with, I guess, human frailty. The novel itself, in the fact that it is historical, looks backwards, but the actual narrative looks forward to new movements. For instance, you have Will, who is portrayed as a romantic artist, and you have his German painters and his German thinkers who would lead Victorian England and change intellectual thought, which Eliot herself was a part of. One thing I've noticed so far at the very beginning of this novel is already how Eliot is kind of taking these big scopes, these big ideas, and showing their limitations because of humans because of ourselves. Obviously this is the most clear with Dorothea. Dorothea has ideals of learning and of education and that she wants to find this through marrying Mr. Casaborn. Even in the first 14 chapters, Eliot subverts so much, especially in terms of the marriage plot, which is obviously a big part of Victorian literature. Majority of novels will end in a happy marriage as an answer to uh, any problems or to kind of end the narrative arc of our heroine but for Dorothea it is just the beginning but it only takes about 90 pages until Dorothea is aware that her idealism or her optimism in terms of marriage or what she wanted from a marriage isn't going to come true and in fact even in the prelude we know that things aren't going to work out. For these later born Teresas were helped by no coherent social faith and order which could perform the function of knowledge for the ardently willing soul. Their ardour alternated between a vague ideal and the common yearning of womanhood, so that one was disapproved of as extravagance and the other condemned as a lapse. Here and there is born a Saint Teresa, foundress of nothing, whose loving heart beats and sobs after an unattained goodness tremble off and are dispersed among hindrances, instead of centering in some long recognisable deed. From the very beginning, Middlemarch is presented as a novel of unfulfillment, and in that way it is remarkable, and I don't think I've actually ever read anything like this, that doesn't associate marriage with a happy ending, and that it doesn't associate with social progress, and the optimism around social progress as necessarily being a good thing. The fact that the narrator knows so much more than the characters, and knows so much more than us, even in the novel, the narrator interjects to remind us that we don't know that much about the characters. We don't know that much about the situation and undermines us as well as the characters. It is ironic and satirical and funny, but at the heart of it, there is something sad and unfulfilled, as I will say a million times. And the optimism that I tend to associate with these narratives of having a happy ending I don't know if Middlemarch is going to have a happy ending. I don't know what is going to happen, and that is a truly beautiful thing in a Victorian novel. I'm interested to see how all of these threads come together and how the different lives join up with each other, but I am hooked. And I think Elliot is a masterful writer. There are so many things I could have talked about in this video, uh, but I didn't want to kind of just sit here and just shout things. I wanted to kind of take a moment with my thoughts on this novel and where I am at the moment, which again is at the very beginning. I could have done a whole video on Casaborn and his unfulfilled potential too. Casaborn is one of the characters with the most unfulfilled, you know, sense of worth and his work and the fact that all his work is basically useless. I mean, it's heartbreaking. There are so, there's just so many things. I could talk about Mr. Brooke for ages. It's fascinating and I haven't even talked about any of the plot points so I'd be interested to see how you think about Middlemarch, do you see it as a historical novel, what impact you think the historical and kind of the social context has on the novel and whether you see optimism as being one of the root causes for unhappiness or the failings in these characters and also what do you think of the narrator? I am so intrigued by the narrator. Normally I feel like the narrator would either be on the side of the reader or on the side of the character, 
but I feel like they don't like any of the characters, which is really fascinating. And when we as readers start to like the characters, it's almost like the narrator like reminds us why we shouldn't like them or why they're bad. So I am fascinated. I would also just like to know whether you're enjoying the novel. It's obviously a massive part, especially when you're doing a read-along, whether you're actually enjoying it. I'm really enjoying it. I do feel like it's a bit like two novels stuck together at this point, and I'm interested to see how they come together. Everything I thought Middle March would be, it's not. And I kind of love that about it, because I don't think I've read a novel quite like it before just because of how unhappy everybody's going to be. I don't know if they're going to be unhappy, but I have a sense that this novel's just going to like end with loads of people crying and being very sad and then eventually dying, like everybody in Victorian writing. I hope you enjoyed this ramble. I had so many thoughts that I wanted to talk about and so many things annotated that I wanted to quote you and read to you, but sometimes you just need to talk and just think through your feelings or things you picked up in a novel. And I guess this is supposed to be like an online book club, so this is what it would be like if I was in your book club, sitting there and talking way too much about the different reform acts. I hope you've had a lovely weekend, and I'll see you again next Sunday with another video on Middlemarch, which I think is going to be about Middlemarch and marriage, but who knows.